let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'm happy to introduce Matthew Morrow, who's going to tell us about aspects of motivic cohomology in two talks today and tomorrow. So Matthew was uh, a, did his PhD at Nottingham. He was a postdoc and a Simons Fellow at the University of Chicago, um, and then a postdoc at Bonn, and now he's Chargé de Recherche at CNRS based in Jussieu. So Matthew. Oh, and I should say, you know, he's known throughout the world for his contributions to algebraic K-theory and piatic Hodge theory. So Matthew, cool. take it away. Well, thanks very much, Ben, for this generous introduction. Uh, <laughs> I'd also like to express my thanks to all the other, all the other organizers for inviting me to take part in this, but also the, the PCMI staff for making it possible. And the, the, one sees that they're, they're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And finally, to my fellow speakers who have saved me some work, because thanks to them, you have already seen some of the following it will be relevant to my talks. Um, so already in the very first talk by Krashen, some motivic complexes appeared. We'll be it quickly. And Milner K theories cropped up a couple of times. The relation that both these invariants have to a tau cohomology has played a role. Again, particularly in Krashen's talk, that was block Cato conjecture. And then in, in De Gleese's talk, you've seen some. A1 homotopy theory. And what else in some more categorical aspects like categories of pre sheaves with transfer. And this has all mostly been for maybe entirely actually, unless someone wants to correct me otherwise, uh, for varieties typically smooth, maybe not all the time. Over some over some base field. So now what's what's left for me to do? We're going to aim for the following. Firstly, I'm really going to be interested in this motivic cohomology, just well, for, from one point of view, just as a, just as an intrinsic invariant. So the, the cohomology that, that comes out of some of these categorical aspects that that the Gleese is going to be talking about. We'll just study the cohomology that it outputs. Um, but particularly as a tool to analyze algebraic K theory. And then the second topic, which I'll, I'll get onto pathway into tomorrow's talk, will be uh, some recent progress in mixed characteristics. So where we discard this hypothesis that we're working over a base field, we try to prove some things in greater generality, not even with any, with any smoothness or regularity hypotheses. So in light of this first goal that we want to say something about algebraic K theory, I'd like to spend a decent amount of time today just going over some classical calculations so that you can see some other baby cases of where, we'd, of where we'd like to get. So the first section will just be devoted to some, some of the theory of K0 and K1. And the phenomenon that I really want you to keep in mind, which if I, if I remember, I'm gonna to try to always remake, write it in green, is the following. So K theory, is a, K theory is something very, very general. And what we're typically going to see um, is that it encodes other invariants and in a related phenomena is that it, it breaks into simpler pieces. I don't know if simple is necessarily the right word. And 
and these will, brought, will turn out to be motivic in nature. So this story starts, of course, with uh, this definition of K0, uh, going back to Grotendieck in the 50s. So let's start by recalling that. So we take some, some ring R, which could for the moment be any, I guess, any associative unital ring. But in, in fact, I'm, at some point, I'm going to implicitly be assuming that all my rings are commutative, because otherwise, I'm almost certainly going to say something wrong. Um, and then we define this K0 of R, the so-called Grotendieck group, uh, is the abelian group defined as follows. So we generate it by free, excuse me, we generate it by finite projective modules over the ring, or perhaps more precisely by isomorphism classes of such. So here P is running over finite projective R modules. And we mod out by the simple relation that we force, we force direct sums or equivalently short exact sequences to become summation in the group. Uh, so modular the relations that the class of P is the class of P prime plus the class of P double prime um, whenever we have a short exact sequence relating zero goes to P prime, goes to P, goes to P double prime, goes to zero. And let me mention parenthetically right away to just to save myself from doing it later that we can adopt the same definition for any scheme just by replacing uh, these finite projective modules by vector bundles. Or we can do the same thing for any topological space by looking at, at real vector bundles or, or complex vector bundles. And that I, I suppose we'll do it some, some moment later. So the definition is pretty simple, but it, it, already, it already outputs some, some interesting phenomenon. So we're going to explore this in a few examples. So uh, let me start by recalling the case of a field. Then, okay, my finite projective modules, these are just vector spaces, excuse me. These are just vector spaces. And in this way, I can produce an isomorphism given by the dimension function, taking any such vector space and associating to it its dimension over the field. And one sees that this is an isomorphism because as soon as you know it, as soon as you know, uh, as soon as you know the dimension of a vector space, you you know the vector space after isomorphism, and short exact sequences are compatible with with dimension. Uh, so that's that's not so interesting, but it's really place to start. Uh, so next next case of interest, we go up one dimension, uh, and we're going to look at Dedekind domains. Let me take O to be a Dedekind domain. Uh, for example, you can take ring of integers in a number field. So what's important is that then any ideal, at least if it's non-zero, I guess even if it's zero, even if it's zero, cool. Zero is a finite projective module. So each ideal is a finite projective module. I guess that characterizes uh, regular rings of dimension at most one. And so we get its class inside K0. And what then turns out to be true is that we completely, we can break up this K0 into a short exact sequence as follows. 
So as before, I've got some map to the integers given by taking my finite projective module and sending it to its rank. And we can completely understand the kernel of this in terms of the class group. So here I put the class group of O, that is to say non-zero ideals under multiplication. And so if I have a non-zero ideal in the class group, what do I send it to in K0? I don't send it to the class of I. I in fact, I send it to the class of I minus the class of O itself, which is the identity element there. Which looks a little funny initially, but this is what you need to do in order to produce a map that respects the additive structures on the two groups involved. Because the class group, the multiplicative law there is exactly given by, by multiplying ideals together, whereas in K0, it's given by taking the direct sum. But that turns out to be compatible with the group structures and produces a short exact sequence. And the moral to take away from that is that we break up K0 Uh, into the class group, to some classical invariant one is interested in, and a copy of Z. So moving on to higher dimensions still, let's look at the case now of some smooth algebraic variety over a field. Probably needed to be quasi-projective, what I'm going to say, or at least to Satisfy some other technical condition, but I think we can we can we can ignore that for the sake of simplicity. Um, so what do we do in this case? So let's suppose that we've got some cycle, that is to say, some some irreducible closed subvariety on X. Uh, whose co-dimension we'll care about in a moment, but not just yet, um, we can pick a resolution of the structure sheaf of, of Z as follows. So I've got structure sheaf of Z, and I pick some resolution P0 through some PD, where this resolution is given by some vector bundles. And this is where one probably needs some technical hypothesis like quasi-projectivity. Um, and once we've got such a resolution, we can then associate to this subvariety z a class inside k0 as follows. I take the alternating sum of the classes of these vector bundles. And one can check by identifying, this is discussed a little bit more in the, in the exercises in the notes, by identifying K0 with G0 defined in terms of, of all coherent sheaves on X, one can check that this class is, is really well-defined. So it's a well-defined element associated just to, just to Z, not to this particular resolution that we've picked. And so uh, from these, these classes, we associate a filtration on K0. To find fill J of K0X to be the subgroup of K0 uh, generated by the classes of things having co-dimension at most J. 
So this is some irreducible closed oh, co-dimension at most j. So then I've got my, my orders right. We have k0 contains fill d, where well, I suppose d is another dimension, contains and so on and so forth down to fill zero, zero step of the filtration, and that contains zero. So it's a decreasing filtration. And I've told you all this for the sake of the following, the following theorem, which is part of riemann rock theory. So we have a map now, I guess, in fact, part of the theorem is that this map makes sense. Um, I look at the um, Chow group of R. Uh, I'm, I'm confused here. Oh, I made a mistake. I think you mean <coughs> dimensionless than very quickly. Ah, uh, that's entirely possible. That, that's a minor mistake, but this is, uh, but I'm gonna do a Chow upper J. You're right, I should put my indices somewhere else. Yeah. Can I do fill upper J and then? You can, but it's, Still, the, the top one is okay. I'll just put a lower j. Okay, something bigger than or equal to j. Then, right, right. No, I'm not sure. I mean, you've got to swap you can, you both. Can choose, but I can choose, but I should <laughs> choose in the right, choose in a consistent fashion. <laughs> so I make that dimension, and then I just need to do fill. Yeah. Now, as long as I do chow lower j, everything's okay, is it? So I now take Chow dimension of my Chow group of J dimensional cycles modulo rational equivalence. Thank you, Mark. I get a map as part of the theorem is that this map is well defined to fill J modulo fill j minus one by sending, okay, I just take uh, my cycle, I assume it's irreducible and I send it to, well, I guess we move back, it's on one side to make it look a bit better. I take my cycle, I send it to this class that I've defined a moment ago. And the theorem, say this is a, a well-defined Subjective so modus by definition, um, and its kernel is killed by J minus one factorial. And here I'm okay for dimension code, I mentioned Mark, am I? So one can, one can say more than that, but I. Just for the sake of simplicity, let me. How the j minus one is is the is should be the j it should be a d minus j minus one. Sorry. Right. No. 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 I do everything with code I mentioned you did. So yeah. by d minus j plus one. Great to have Mark on board too. There we go. Uh, I think minus one. No, it's minus. Is it not minus j minus one? Or can you do better? No, it's just the code maybe dimension you know, minus, the code dimension you know minus one. Oh, it's the code dimension minus one, sorry, you're right, you're right, thank you. Anyway. Thank you, thank you. no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay. In a moment, I'm gonna say small torsion, which is then sufficiently imprecise that I, I cover all the bases. Um, so all the, the, the pieces of this filtration coming from this generally defined K0 identify with algebraic cycles. So let me just write down the, the mantra to remember up to small torsion, Uh, K0 of X breaks into Chow groups. And what we saw for Dedekind domains a moment ago is in fact just a special case of that. So there already with K0, we see some phenomena that this, as I said, that this generally defined K theoretic invariant breaks into interesting pieces in some sense. And so continuing this theme, let's, let's go on to K1.
uh, which goes back to, I think also to the 50s defined by Bass. The idea of the definition being that we're going to well, classify isomorphisms between finite projective or finite free modules up to trivial changes of bases given by, given by elementary matrices. I just see there's some activity in the chat. Let me check here. What do we do when J equals D is the kernel automatic trivial things go by J minus one. Yeah, when J equals D, there won't be any kernel. Uh, let Mark correct me if from K theory, but not. Matthew, you can Mark. ignore the chat. I'll, no, I'll... no, 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 no. If, if it just takes a second, I'm happy to. If people are too shy to ask out loud, then by all means, they will have a quick oh. Okay. Um, so let me move on to K1, though. So we've got K1 of my wing. As I say, we want to somehow classify uh, isomorphisms between three modules, but up to trivial isomorphisms. And then we do that as follows. So I take some, this infinite general linear group. To find as follows, I take union over all n of GLNR, where, okay, GLN I include into GLN plus one by sending a matrix to just add a one at the bottom right. So in other words, it's it's infinite invertible matrices, but which are eventually just ones along the diagonal and zeros in some outside some block. And I mod this out by uh, elementary matrices. So this again is infinite union of all ENRs. Where ENR contained inside GLNR is a say subgroup of what you get if you apply elementary row and column operations to the identity. One checks that that, at least in passing to the limit over n, gives me a normal subgroup. So as I say, somehow precisely classifying isomorphisms up to up to obvious change of basis. So starting again with the case of could start again with the case of a field, uh, but more generally, let me make a make this make a comment that we we always have the so-called determinant map from k1 of r back to the unit of r given by this is represented by some matrix inside some gln and i just spit out its determinant in the usual sense um, and this is even going to have a a right inverse. By taking a unit in the ring and just looking at the matrix starting with that unit and then being ones all down the rest of the diagonal. And so, okay, now we can do a calculation in the in the case of a field. Um, so in that case, Elementary matrices are just the whole special linear group. So it's supposed to be an F. Uh, that, uh, that's uh, Gaussian elimination, isn't it? Stating that if you if you take some determinant one matrix over a field, you can perform row and column operations to it until you get back to the identity. So that provides that equality of groups. Uh, and so we see the modding out by elementary matrices is the same as modding out by, by determinant one matrices. In other words, this determinant map of 
provides us with just an isomorphism between k1 of the field and the units of the field. So may, at the risk of presenting maybe a, a silly calculation, let me say that we can now already see some very elementary relation to, to a tau cohomology in this case. I can look at K1 now mod M. Uh, this is for M uh, in prime to the characteristic. And so this we've just identified with units mod M, which we can then identify by a Kuma theory with the first Galois cohomology with coefficients in mu M which is of course very baby case of block cutter. So continuing upper dimension again, um, let me, instead of treating arbitrary Dedekind domains, let's let O be the ring of integers in some number field. Um, then it, it again turns out to be true that this determinant map identifies K1 uh, just with the units of O, but unlike the case of a field, um, this is now a, a, a rather deep theorem. Uh, originally proved by Bass, Milner, and Serre. And there's a second proof due to Cajodan. But in both cases, somehow you have to get your hands dirty with some representation theoretic properties of, of arithmetic groups. There's some real content in this. Um, and in particular, I'd like to emphasize that it's, it's not a nonsense statement about Dedekind domains, as we saw in the case of K0. For example, if we take functions on a circle, which is again a Dedekind domain, um, then one can produce a non-zero class in the kernel of the determinant map. So result three, really, it fails for arbitrary Dedekind domains. And what we, we see happening in this case, and how does one check that this class is non-zero in the K group, one uses the fact that it corresponds to a loop going around the circle. And so let me say very roughly as, a, as another an instance of this phenomena, that what's happening in this case is that the K group is, is really it's decomposing into some data coming from units and some info about loops. And this information about loops turns out to vanish in the case of ring of integers of a number field. But again, implicitly hiding behind it, there's some, there's some decomposition into other pieces. And so it's this, it's this phenomenon of decomposition that we want to, that we want to explore in, in motivic cohomology. Um, but to do that, we need to first, this, this, this decomposition is going to concern what happens in higher algebraic K theory. So I want to start with, I want to, before going on to motivic cohomology, just say a few words about, um, about higher algebraic K theory. But I don't want to spend too long on it because that would be a, that would be a lecture series in its, in its own right. And I imagine that you already at least, will be may perhaps only briefly encountered it. Um, so, so what happened, uh, I mean, as a, as a very simplistic presentation of the history, 
was that by the 60s, it was clear for a number of reasons that K0 and K1 should really just be the beginning of some exceptional cohomology thing. And so there should exist some, some, some higher cohomological invariants, these so-called K groups, to all n, n bigger than or equal to zero. And the, the question of the time was, how can, how can, how can we define these? And Quillen came along and got his Fields Medal for proposing multiple definitions. Um, which I don't have the time to present in, in, in all their gory detail, but I'd like to give some idea what happens anyway. So as I say, he gave multiple definitions of uh, this K-theory space, or more correctly, K-theory spectrum, it's an infinite loop space, K of R, um, so here's, here's one option which I, which I, I quite like. So as we've just seen, we've, sort of, we've just seen K1, and one of these constructions is in some sense you derive this, you derive this, this K1 construction. As follows, uh, so the output's gonna be the whole K theory space. as follows. So we again form this infinite general linear group. Then we take its classifying space. So that is to say we get some, some connected space whose Pi one is just given by this monstrous group GLR and whose higher homotopic groups vanish. I'll say it's strictly bigger than one. And then we modify it. This is Quillen's inside by something called the plus construction, which means that we. So we're going to it will change the space in such a way that forces the homotopy groups to become abelian. See, at the moment, the first homotopy group of our space is GLR, which is highly non-abelian. And so what we do is we force all the homotopy groups to be abelian, but without touching the homology. And Quillen showed that makes sense. Produces some new space and remarkably, although you start with a space which only has anything interesting in the pi one, remarkably when you perform this process, some very mysterious information spreads out into all higher homotopy groups. And these higher homotopy groups are precisely what we care about. And to be careful for pedants, I should throw in a copy of K0 of R into this space just so that I get the right result on K0. But for the higher homotopy groups, this is, this is not relevant. So that for, for the higher homotopy groups, the idea is really this, that you derive this K1 construction by, by so forcing the, the homotopy groups of BGLR to be, to be abelian in this, this Produces all these these wacky classes in higher degree that we don't understand, but which seem to be amazing. Um, so 
so I mean that that that's one of his that was one of his constructions, and he also had his his Q construction. Um, but I mean this is so this this BGLR plus construction is great for doing hands-on calculations. It's, it's what he used for doing all the initial hard hands-on calculations in the theory. But for, for, for general theory, or at least from a modern point of view, it's, it's not really what one uses. Um, so I just wanted to parenthetically make a, make a few comments about that. Now from a more modern point of view, uh, it's a, it's another closer in spirit to K zero would be would be either the following. I can define um, this, is, this can be the, 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 the connective K theory spectrum by taking instead of the group completion, I take the infinity group completion. of the e infinity space given by looking at the category of projected modules and restricting to, to isomorphisms that forms a, that forms an e infinity space like an e infinity group completed and that will produce a near, near connected spectrum but if these words are meaningless to you then then, then don't worry about it um, another point of view is that K theory in a, in a more general context, so not just of, of rings, um, is the universal, sometimes it's a universal way of linearizing. No, it's a universal way of, of well, again, it's, it's sort of a universal group completion approach. Um, so it's a universal invariant of, uh, stable infinity categories taking uh, exact sequences, these are exact sequences now of stable infinity categories to co fiber sequences of spectra plus some other conditions. And then from that point of view, you define the K theory of a ring by looking at the K theory of perfect complexes. Perfect complexes of R modules. End of parenthetical comment. All that I ask you to take away from this is that in any case, uh, output is these mysterious K groups. Which more than one person in the room has been trying to calculate for a very long time. And uh, you know, the, the point of view that I really want to adopt in the remainder of these talks, uh, this point of view is not novel, but motivic cohomology is a, is a useful way to do this. And sort of variance of motivic cohomology, motivic invariance, it's a very general sense that I'll, I'll try to get onto in more detail, more detail next time. Um, but just remaining for a moment on the subject of these mysterious invariants, let's see just, just how mysterious they are. Uh, so Quillen in 73, he did one of the very, very few, wait, maybe it's the only, maybe it's still the only complete calculation of K groups that we have, which is the case of a finite field. Uh, so in degree zero, I just get a copy of zero. Excuse me, in degree zero, I get a copy of Z. Um, in even degree, 
I don't get anything. And in odd degree, I get a cyclic group of order Q to the degree plus one over two minus one. But then everything goes downhill. Um, we don't even know the K groups of the integers. And in fact, we know that it's hard to know the K groups of the integers because it's a theorem that the vanishing of the, of the mod four K groups, the K groups of degree divisible by four is equivalent by a theorem of Kurihara at the date from 92 uh, to the Van der Veer conjecture. So the Van der Veer conjecture is a statement about cyclotomic number fields stating that if you look at the maximal real subfield of a cyclotomic number field obtained by joining a P through of unity, then the class number is not divisible by P. That's widely open, which right, that's just some. In fact, I guess we understand most of the rest of the K groups of, of Z. Um, so there's calculations that we don't understand, but then there's also sort of general properties that we don't understand. Suppose you take some regular, some regular ring, which is is finitely generated over Z. Um, then the K group should be finitely generated. Uh, that's for all N. And that's, I mean, that's totally open. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's known if the dimension is at most one. Again, by some by classical calculations and everything else. Everything else we don't know what to do. As another example, okay, this is this calculation where there's going to be a positive result. Let's take F to be a field um, of characteristic prime to some n. Then, okay, let me stick this in green because it's supposed to be an instance of the phenomenon that we're, we're keeping an eye out for. This is again, special case of block Carto, uh, K2, not too many twos, K2 mod M will identify with second Galois cohomology coefficients in mu M tensor two. And that's uh, the McCrory of Switzerland theorem. which is now a special case of block logic, which we'll come to a little bit later. So now again, we have a description of this abstractly defined K group and so in terms of some, some, previously, uh, some previously interesting invariant. So you can, I guess, depending on your point of view, you can either view it as a calculation of the K group, which is nice because we want to calculate K groups, or you can view it as some, some new description of what you see on the Atal cohomology set. Both points of view have their role to play. No, it's not from the 50s, it must be from the 70s. Um, so then finally in this list of general properties and expectations, I want to mention it, it again goes back to Cullen's original work in, in, in the 70s. Um, so partly motivated uh, by zeta functions. So there were, there were conjectural formulae, particularly explored by Lichtenbaum, uh, giving the special values of zeta functions in terms of, in terms of K groups. 
but then you can make uh, similar predictions of such descriptions in terms of a tau cohomology and they, they lead you to expect some relations between the K groups and the tau cohomology groups. And what this finally led to, let me just say it in the case of, in the case of a number field to keep things easily. Um, so for a number field, F, um, any M bigger than or equal to one, they conjectured, let me just say a relation, a formula, say formulate for the K groups of F with mod M coefficients in terms of a tau cohomology. And we're going to see the precise formula a little bit later, so let me not bother writing it down. And in fact, here I've cheated a little bit and I've reverse engineered the result because when you look at the original conjectures, they usually stated for the ring of integers or, or even the ring of S integers with respect to some, some fixed set of primes S, but then you can pass the limit over S and get some results for the, for the number field itself, which will just be, it'll be easier to state in terms of the, the way I'm going to present things. Um, so instead of a tau cohomology, I could have said Galois cohomology, but let me uh, do my usual game of coloring this in. And this is supposed to be an instance of the sort of phenomena we're going to keep an eye out for. And it's, it's describing K theory in terms of some other known invariants. Um, so I don't want to say anything else. I wanted to make a quick remark on, on K theory with coefficients because it's, it's going to start appearing. So this is K-theory with coefficients. Um, so in the usual way, I mean, once you've got the, the K-theory space or spectrum, you can construct a, a mod M version of it, whose homotopy groups will then fit into uh, short exact sequences as follows. Right, these next space where this final term is the m torsion in the in the group one down. And so this will appear. This will appear quite a lot. Um, I mean, it, it should maybe be be remarked that. Even if one understands some K group coefficients, it doesn't mean that one understands these individual terms. It's very often not very clear how the information gets wrapped together to produce the information in the middle term. So even if you understand like, all K groups with coefficients, you very often can't reverse engineer the information to, to understand the K group itself, which, which is a shame, but that's the way it is. So with these um, preliminaries on K-theory out of the way, now we can really jump in, oops, and jump in to the arrival of motivic formulas. And so the, I've labored this point a little bit, but here's the sort of question that I, I really want to really want to explore. Um, so in what generality do the above phenomena hold? That is to say, like, when can we describe K-theory in terms of other known invariants? When does it break up into nicer pieces? Uh, and I was, well, I guess I better include topological example. That uh, it's always true in topology. Uh, 
So in the following sense, um, so if you've got any topological space X, you can associate to it its, its topological K zero uh, defined using complex vector bundles. So again, you do the same as before, you look at complex vector bundles up to uh, isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles and force short exact sequences to give you, give you sums. Um, and then you can do a little bit more work using uh, suspension and bot periodicity tricks. Mm, bot periodicity to produce a whole slew of K groups. I guess I'd better go over all integers. And so this gives you the analog of the algebraic K theory that we're studying, but for, but for topological spaces, it's of course much older than the, than the story of, of algebraic K theory. But one then has this theorem of a tier in Hertzberg. that these always can be described in terms of prior existing invariant, namely singular cohomology. So there's a spectral sequence coming from various copies of the singular cohomology of the space and converging to these topological K groups of the space. And it degenerates rationally. So if we only care about what's going on up to small torsion, we can even decompose all of our topological K groups just into singular cohomology. So I'll write that down, topological K theory breaks into singular cohomology. So motivated by all these phenomena that we, again, I'm probably maybe I'm misrepresenting the history a little bit, motivated by all these phenomena that we've seen above of special phenomena K0 and K1 and what, what Lixenbaum and Quillen were conjecturing should happen for the K groups of rings of integers of number fields. And what we see here coming from the topological picture, um, the following framework of conjectures was proposed, excuse me, by Balinson and Lichtenbaum in the in the eighties. They proposed, we proposed, they proposed the existence of the typical model. Which says what well, I want to adopt a reasonably axiomatic point of view that we expect the existence of certain cohomology theory with, with certain properties so as they did. So let me restrict for the moment to smooth varieties over fields. Um, and so for any such gadget, there should exist a cohomology theory So there should exist some complexes, which I'm going to call Z motivic weight J of X. 
for all j bigger than or equal to zero. This is I say is weight j motivic cohomology. Of X um, with, a, with a whole bunch of properties, it's not so interesting otherwise. So let's start looking. What do we expect? So, well, the most fundamental one that I really care about is the relation to K theory. Namely, we have an analog of the Tio Hertz book spectral sequence. I mean, that for me is really the next time we'll discuss variations on this theme. We want to describe other K theoretic invariants in terms of other motivic invariants. And the, 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 the test that you've got the right thing is, is that you have such a spectral sequence. And so in this case, we get a spectral sequence uh, coming with the same indexing. I haven't messed things up from the motivic cohomology of X. But now we've got to take account of all the possible weights and again, converging to the, the K groups of X. Where, just to be clear about notation, so by the motivic cohomology groups, I just mean I take the uh, the, the, the cohomology groups of this, of this complex. But I want to make certain statements directly in terms of the complex rather than rather than passing to the cohomology groups. Um, and it should degenerate rationally. And so then rationally, the, the K groups exactly decompose just into some sort of motivic cohomology groups. But in general, we can still say that um, okay, modulo the degeneration issue of the spectral sequence, we see that the K groups are splitting up and decomposing in some sense, or at least admit descriptions in terms of, in terms of motivic cohomology. Uh, in low weights, one wants uh, a good description of what's going on. So the weight zero motivic cohomology, this is not very interesting. It's just going to tell us something about the number of connected components. So it's just gonna be sitting in degree zero and there it's gonna give us the number of connected components. A little bit better is weight one. That will be given by just taking Zariski cohomology of, of units of OX star and then moving it a little bit to the right. So let me make some silly comments about where these complexes live. So in, in the case of degree zero, that's of course just supported in degree zero. And in the case of degree one, well, I'm really, I should really go to the right hand side. The, if I take cohomology of, of units on a normal scheme, then it's only sitting in degree zero and one. We have a nice resolution for the, for the structure sheet on, on a normal scheme. So that's going to be supported in degrees. Oh, since I've shifted it a little bit to the right. The final thing is supported in degrees one and two. And what in general is supposed to be true in general is true, apart from the vanishing to the left, as we'll, as we'll see in a moment, is that the motivic complex uh, in weight J. Should be supported in degrees zero through 
true J. Uh, even I mean, this is turned out to be true, even uh, in degrees less than j if x is the spectrum of a local world. Next one has. Uh, Next, we can begin to discuss relations to other invariants. Uh, uh, otherwise, somehow it's not interesting. We don't want, we don't just want to understand algebraic K theory. We don't want to understand algebraic K theory in terms of existing invariants. And so we now need to say a few words about how the motivic cohomology is supposed to be related to, to other invariants. So we start with the relation to algebraic cycles. So we'll say a word in a moment about uh, higher child groups, but let me just stick with, with usual child groups for the moment. Then the degree 2j, weight j, motivic cohomology is child uh, upper j. No, fuck, Barry's made these days, but I think this one's okay. All the j's are upstairs, so it should be all right, the general rule. Um, so we detect algebraic cycles in terms of motivic cohomology, and then really I can finish on the like the most important part, which is relation to tau cohomology, which is really the, the core and what is very often just goes under the name of Bayless and Nixon band conjecture. Um, which states that these motivic cohomology groups, if I work with finite coefficients, so as previously, that means I take my complex, I take it mod M, and then I take the, the cohomology of that mod M complex. These will just on the nose be a tau cohomologies with coefficients in mu M in the J take twist of mu m um, if m is prime to characteristic of the base field and this is the important part maybe i should have put it first i is at most j so in the range where you're computing the motivic cohomologies up to the weight you understand it on the nose in terms of a tau cohomology And so let's now let's 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 do a calculation with that to see see what that really gives us in practice. So let me take. Uh, so let's let's okay. So let's I want to make this this I mentioned a moment ago conjecture of of Lichtenbaum and Quillen about K theory of number fields. Uh, so let's 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 make that precise now. Let's compute k groups of number fields. Number fields f uh, as predicted by Lichtenberg and Quillen. Um, at least, what are we going to do? Where are we only going to be able to compute them? Uh, modulo m for m odd. So, how do we do this? We look at the mod m version of the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence. So here's where I put my H zero 
Galois f coefficient in, I guess, just z mod m. And then as I go down the down the vertical axis, I get Galois cohomology of f coefficient in mu m. Then I get an h2 Galois coefficient in mu m tensor 2. And then I would get an H3 with coefficients in mu m tensor 3, except I don't because for odd, because m is odd, the cohomological dimension of f being a number field is at most 2. So I don't get any H3. And so now I can continue computing and continue writing down my spectral sequence. Here I'll pick up an H0, again, coefficients in mu m. Here I'll have an H1 coefficients in mu m tends to 2. Over here I'll have an H0, again, coefficients in mu m second twist. Then I'll have an H2 coefficients in mu m tends to 3. And OK, I'll continue. My spectral sequence will continue down like this. And everywhere else, I get lots and lots of zeros. H1, H2. Uh, do I need to worry about an H2 here? Maybe I'll put that in H2. I don't really care about what happens to K0 anyway, uh, but I don't think it's there. So I don't think it's there. But I don't care if it is. I don't actually really care what happens over here. And so what do we conclude? We see that in fact, there's no interesting arrows in the spectral sequence. The arrows should go like, like that. So all the arrows are zero. And so we can just read straight off that prepared the answer earlier. I'm going to put it in green because it's a very nice uh, example of the phenomenon that I'm supposed to be promoting. We compute that the odd k groups with z mod m coefficients, these are just given on the nose by certain Galois cohomologies. And that the even indexed k groups will fit into short exact sequences involving an H0 on the right. Uh, is that right? Yes, that seems okay. It'll be weight J. And the edge map coming in, I've got to put together this term and this term. Edge map coming in will be an H2 of a mu m tensor j plus one. I haven't messed up the indexing, I think it's okay. And so we see that we can really extract, are the indices legible? See that we can really extract some awesome on the nose description of the, of the k groups in this case. And so that's the, that's the power of the machine, if you like, uh, that we have on the one hand, the, this abstract relation given by the atiyah hertzberg spectral sequence, just breaking up K theory into motivic cohomology. But then we have these other relations to a tau cohomology coming through Berlin's and Lichtenbaum. And together, we, we make lots of progress on analyzing, on analyzing K groups. Okay, so I stated all that, all that above as a, as, a, as a conjectural framework of Berlin's and Lichtenbaum. Um, but the theorem is that it's almost all known to be true. And thanks to, can include to many people Block, Levine, Friedlander. I've tried to put this in alphabetical order. Rost, Suslin, Vavotsky, uh, The above conjectures are true. Except, and it's a big except because it's, it's a pain, 
except for the part that was that's known as Balen and Sule vanishing. Namely, that these gadgets are supposed to be supported in positive degree. So as it stands, one might get negative cohomology, which is, is not very satisfactory, but we, we don't know better. So having stated this, I thought it would be, be good to present at least a definition of, the, of, these, motivic, of these motivic complexes, which I think has, has not yet appeared um, in any of the talks. Because it is surprising how quickly you can write down a definition. I mean, then what's extremely hard is checking the properties, which don't actually go through the definition I present. Um, but the, I mean, the fact is that in, within five minutes, I can write down the definition of these complexes that turn out a, a posteriori to do the trick. Um, so, so let's do that. The original definition is, is blocks uh, higher cycle complexes. I mean, one of the great things about the definition action is it continues to work in greater degree of generality. So this I'll, I'll come on to in the next talk. Not only does it produce something interesting in the singular case, but it continues to work in greater degree of generality than just working over fields. S still seems to produce the expected motivic invariant for reasonable schemes over Dedekind domains, for example, over the integers, which is in some sense the only case you need to need to treat, uh, largely thanks to, to work of Levine. I'll probably have time to say a little bit about this, about this next time. For the moment, let me stick to, to fields, uh, to varieties over fields, so I might as well drop the, the smoothness hypothesis. Um, so for variety X, Over a field, um, we look at the following sort of free abelian group on cycles. I'm going to take the free, uh, what sort of cycles am I going to take? I take the free abelian group uh, on, pretty sure this time I'm right about co-dimension, on co-dimension J irreducible uh, closed subschemes of what, not of X itself, but of X times this algebraic simplex. So let's, okay, let's, let's finish the sentence and then we'll, Define some terms intersecting all faces properly. Okay, so what do we need to define? Uh, we need to define this gadget there. This, as I say, is this algebraic, the n simplex, say spec of k adjoined t0 through tn, or the n dimensional one, and I mod it out, this is already all just some gain in normalizations by the sum of the ti's minus one. So that's isomorphic to uh, just affine n space. Oh, sorry, I guess my k is, uh, there's no name for my field. That's the reason for the uh, I guess my base field can be, I take it to be F and I've got to fix it. So that's isomorphic to affine N space, uh, but for the for the understanding the simplicial interactions between the different dimensions, one works with, with this normalization. Um, because now sitting inside this, I have various faces. 
given by delta m's where m is smaller than n. I look at the vanishing loci of various ti's. They cut out for me various copies of delta m's for m is at most n. And so then when I talk about faces of x times delta n, I mean these various x times delta m's for m less than n. I have various copies of these x times delta m sitting as faces inside. And when I say that the cycle that I've got to intersect these faces properly, I mean, in the usual, uh, in the usual way, uh, in the expected co-dimension. So there's no strange intersection happening. And then what's complex higher cycles is defined by sticking all these together with the boundary maps given by uh, alternating sums of all these intersections. As I say to find the boundary map, I take some, some cycle and I send it to alternating sum from zero to n. You know, I'm supposing that I'm in little zj xn and I send it to the alternating sum of the various intersections. Say the i face x times delta n minus one. Oh, I've got, so I've got n, I've got my mistake for my indexing right there. I think my indexing is okay. I've got n plus one copies of this face sitting inside, I intersect Z with all of them. I take the, internet, the alternating sum over all those intersections. I mean, it's really a, a written down as a complex, but in fact, it's really a simplicial, simplicial abelian group. Um, so that's where this alternating sum comes from. Great. And then the, the Blocks higher Chow groups are the cohomology, the homology. This H index a bit funny. I think I should do H minus H minus one. H lower n. Right, I was going to do H minus n instead because I'm imagining it, okay. but I can well, still just go homological. Homology kind of guy. But it's H right, H right. Because the problem with some of the spectral sequences. Right. So block side charge is then just given by the, the homology of his, of his complex. And I've told you all this because part of the previous theorem that motivic homology exists and has the expected properties is really a comparison that I can define my, we can define motivic cohomology by taking blocks complex 
of cycles and uh, just well, we just need to worry about re-indexing it. So I move it to the right. I move it to the right cohomologically. Maybe then I need to worry about the difference between homology and cohomology, but I think I'm okay there. Um, so the fact that this uh, has the expected properties. Um, but as I commented, to actually to actually prove the properties of the previous theorem, you, you things like Bernays and Lichtenbaum, you you can't do it by passing directly through this definition. Even when Bloch introduced uh, his higher charges, he could prove some bits and pieces of the of the previous theorem, but by by no means everything. And one rather has to pass through the the type of machinery that De Gleese is presenting in his in his talks along with an independent verification that the output of the machinery he's presenting actually produces the same as these, as these high chain groups, which is a highly non-trivial comparison and of a slightly different flavor. Nevertheless, I wanted to present that because it, I mean, it shows in principle that one can write down and in, in the end it took closer to 10 minutes, well, a definition of these motivic complexes that it interests us. Um, and so I, I'd like to finish by returning to some more concrete aspects of the story, namely Milner K theory and Block Carter. Because these, in principle, have nothing to do with higher algebraic K theory nor motivic cohomology, but their proof passes through all this machinery. So the theme is, you know, how are these fancy invariants uh, related to block artifacts? And so since I've only got a few minutes, I can luckily fall back on Krashen's first talk. that uh, let me, I guess I just care about the case of fields. So, so let me do that. If we've got some field F, we can cook up its Milner K groups, which are these, these very explicit invariants. They don't even need to be a field given by tensoring together J copies of the unit and modding out by the so-called Steinberg relation. And Tate then showed that for an integer prime to the characteristic, uh, we have the so-called Tate or Galois or cohomological symbol from the Milner K group, I might as well go mod M into well, the Milner range of the, of the Galois cohomology. Namely into the HJ with coefficients in the Jth tape twist. And the block card of conjecture so that this is supposed to be an isomorphism. Now this of course no longer a conjecture, it's now theorem of Ross and Vojvodsky. States that Tate symbol is an isomorphism. So a priori, it's just related to Milner K theory and Galois cohomology. What's it got to do with algebraic K theory and, and motivic cohomology? 
that's thanks to the following remarkable fact that the Milner K theory shows up in motivic cohomology. Uh, so this is a theorem originally due to Nestorenko and Suzlin. And there's an alternative proof by Totaro. And there's even an alternative proof, I think, just of the surjectivity by Kurtz and muller schnarr stating that any field F we can identify a piece of motivic cohomology in terms of this mill locator. I should say there are natural isomorphisms. So the natural isomorphism okay I can say for each J between the Milner K theory and the what we call the Milner range of the motivic cohomology. It is the, it's, the, it's the top degree of the motivic cohomology. So I look at the HJ of weight J of my field. I uh, was gonna tell you how to define this map, but I don't quite have time to do that. Maybe I could include that in the in the exercises, is I can now instead just, just finish quickly and explain how you get from this plus the sort of conjectures we talked about above to block cutter. So if we now go mod M, what do we see? We say that Milner K theory mod M is going to identify with motivic cohomology with mod M coefficients and weight J. So here, if you're paying attention, you'll see that in principle, there could be a little obstruction term coming from an HJ plus one, but I included in the list of conjectures that when you're local, there's no hj plus ones of weight j. There's nothing beyond the degree j of weight j. And so in fact, I can, there's no obstruction coming and going mod j. I can just pull the mod j inside. But then Valence and Lichtenbaum, since I'm now computing a degree, which is at most the weight, Valence and Lichtenbaum, tells us that this is just the same as the Atal cohomology. And so that produces all the role for us, the, the block cutter isomorphism. But in fact, more is true. Um, let me even just say, let me write down what we've really done. So thus, Valence and Lichtenbaum implies block Cato. But the converse is basically also true. And if you want to see more about that, I strongly recommend the, the book of Hesemeyer and Weibel. The second chapter goes into this in detail and really shows how uh, the block Carter conjecture, the Bayless and Lichtenbaum conjecture, and the Hilbert 90 style conjecture are intertwined and shows you how you can reverse this sort of argument. You throw in some roots of unity and you apply some standard tricks to go backwards. Um, so, in this way, we see that this, this, this one well, of these main conjectures. Um, that we, we now know are true in this framework of motivic cohomology, at the end of the day, somehow they were used to these very concrete, to these very concrete statements that compute k-groups for. And so I'll finish there today, and tomorrow I'll 
begin to get into what happens when we discard this hypothesis that M is prime to the characteristics. We'll start looking at piadic phenomena in characteristic P. We'll look at variants of this type of story. Here, I've really been looking at, at standard K theory on smooth things. We'll explore some variants of that. And then uh, finally get into the, the most recent progress of focusing on what goes on in tau locally in a, in a piadic context. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's thank Matthew for a great talk. No, thanks all for coming. There's been a lively discussion in the chat. Yeah, I see. I've been scared by these numbers going up. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I think so far everything has been answered. So hopefully there are some more questions for Matthew now. Mm, uh, hi, um, I just I was just wondering. You did computations for k groups for number fields, and um, I'm just wondering, do we do the same thing for periodics? And if you can, you know, if you know it for periodics for different primes, will you be able to gather the data for you know the number field just in the spirit of local global principle? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can again calculate K groups of, of local fields and rings of integers in local fields, provided that we, as in the calculation that I did, provided that we work with, with finite coefficients. That's not going to let you completely, not in any way I see, immediately reverse engineer to get the calculations for, for a number field. You, you, we get some formal description of some of the whole K theory spectrum in that way. But if you're trying to get your hands on the individual K groups, that won't quite give it. That will don't not give think, it. Don't think so. No, well, no. It doesn't seem. I mean, you'll get some formal, let's say you should get some formal description of the K theory. No, not even, not even because no, no, no. Now that I think about what the arithmetic square looks like, you, 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 this would let you extract if you knew everything that you wanted to know about the the number field, and the local fields, and the rings of integers inside the local fields. Then you would get some information about the ring of integers of the number field. Mm. That's the best you could do. But it wouldn't give, even that wouldn't give you a precise calculation. But no, if you just know what's going on, say for all the QPs, you can't reverse engineer the information about Qs. I see. Okay. No, it's a good question. I mean, it's a natural approach that's what it takes, but it, it doesn't okay. quite work. Okay. Maybe I could propose very briefly. Um, Weibull has a great survey paper on he this does, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. in the handbook of K-theory and he presents both the local fields and the and the number and you can sort of compare and contrast there. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I have one. Uh, what of the things we have seen depend now on these uh, missing part of the theorem, this uh, balance and soul vanishing? Oh, nothing, I mean, nothing I've said depends on that. Okay. No, no, I, the, the results I presented are all, uh, all unconditional. Okay. So that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. I mean, for the moment, no, but nothing I said requires Benes and Sule vanishing. So that's missing for what then? For which part? <laughs> it's a good question. Actually, I asked myself that while I was preparing the, preparing the notes. I guess you need, maybe, maybe Mark can chime in. I mean, do you, do you still need that to construct the category of motives, I suppose? Um, it's the first, I mean, it's the first obstruction to having, uh, so we, the, we have these triangulated categories of motive, but if you wanted to have an abelian category of like motivic sheaves, the first obstruction is the um, valence and Soule vanishing. That's what you need to have sort of a good theory of motivic Tate sheaves. Sort of saying the X groups of untate motives vanishes in negative degrees. And if you had an abelian category of Tate motives that whose derived category was the image in the triangulated category of motives, then that would be the case. So it, it's, it's, it's a question of whether you have a nice abelian category sitting inside these triangulated categories. 
in the, it's the first obstruction. There are, there are many more. There are more, there are more until the end of the story. That's the first one. Maybe it's worth mentioning too that it is now reduced to rational. Right. Question right. by what you've told us. Right. As you see, I, I showed you that the motivic cohomology mod M just looks like a tau cohomology and there's no negative at tau cohomology. And we also understand it mod P, even when P is the, is the characteristic, we'll see that next time. And again, one sees there's no negative cohomology groups. So it is just a statement about the, the rational the motivic cohomology. And therefore you can even convert it into a statement just about the K groups. You take your K groups rationally, these decompose into Adam's summands, which are the same as the motivic cohomology, and these are supposed to vanish beyond a certain point. So but if you had other conjectures like uh, finite generation, then then that would do it. But the problem is you you don't have these conjectures. Right, and so right. You have the problem of uh, infinite divisible divisible sub. Right, right. Yeah, so for the moment, you might get weird things. I guess you get a copy of Q appearing in negative degree. There's no way to discount that. No, at the moment. right. You can't. Yeah. But but the thing is, there's there's no way to detect it either. No reasonable right. cohomology theory has negative cohomology. So, <laughs> so there can't, can't there can't be anything. Well, great. More more questions. Actually, about that, is there an analog of valence and Soule vanishing for the HZ twiddle of Degliese and Fizel and um, Kalmes? And Bachman, Ostfeyer. I think it's the same. Yeah, I guess so. So that would be this. Okay. Oh, well, there, there's no vanishing in negative degree well, for Witkomoji because it's periodic, eta periodic. So. So I know that I know that there's vanishing along um, along the you know like that. Yeah. This thing that was zero is now non-zero. But this question, this question mark, kind of above, like in the in the upper two quadrants. Like here, if it, like here, you mean got, and Soule or and Soule yeah, I, I associate balance and Soule with like a question mark up here, and the vit stuff, the extra vit stuff down yes. here in quadrant three. Yeah, but it's still in negative cohomological degree. But apart that, you and uh, the, the Milnovic motivic cohomology just. Uh, is a direct factor of a uh, of, uh, of uh, motivic cohomology rational and this vid ah. part that we can compute. And Great. so th there's no, the mystery part is the K theory part. That's rationally. very, thanks. Still, yeah. Any, any other questions for Matthew? Yeah, I, I have another one, which is um, the, that the valence and Lichtenbaum uh, identifying this etal cohomology with the motivic cohomology. I was wondering about relating that to representing a tall cohomology as a spectrum in, in SH. We have um, the, the spectrum, the, the motivic cohomology, um, say mod L, and we inverse the special element tau. Um, is there a relation between that specific calculation of representing a tall cohomology and, um, uh, and valence and Lichtenbaum? I don't know. I'm not sure I really understand. Well, the question is to represent. I think it's a weaker. I think it's a weaker statement. Which one? But just the one that you get a tau cohomology by motivic cohomology with coefficients and then inverting tau. It certainly follows from balance and right. Lichtenbaum, but uh, the implication doesn't go the other way. It's sort of right. You could have things that that die by multiplying with a high power of tau going from motivic cohomology to a tau cohomology. So it, it doesn't, it, it's right. One more time, a little more slowly. You won't... It's saying if you take an, if you invert tau on the a tau cohomology on the motivic cohomology, you get a tau cohomology. So you can yeah. gain a lot and lose a lot by localizing. Yes. Right, so it doesn't say it doesn't say that in a fixed degree, the H uh, e z mod m of q in the degrees where p is less than or equal to q that you get the a tau thing. That it just says if you multiply by a high enough power of tau, you get a high enough power of tau multiple of the class you were trying to get, and there could also be a kernel that get killed by a power of tau. So I think this kind of statement that the localization after tau 
is um, this, this I think was our, for K theory was proven by uh, Thomason. So something like uh, etal K theory is, um, is algebraic K theory in sufficiently high degree, some statement like that. I'm not absolutely sure, but I think he did prove something like that before he had, um, you know, Quillen and Lichtenbaum, which was right. the K theory analog of Valence and Lichtenbaum. I think it's a weaker statement. Just great. Just I get it. I think that's super helpful. Okay. Yeah. Questions from Mark. Yeah. Any, yeah, any <laughs> other? Uh, <laughs> Any other questions at all? I can, I can, I can, I can pass. So let the other guys have fun. <laughs> no. Sorry, I do have one more, but I, I, I can also let. I'll, I'll be quiet. Ask later. Okay, I propose, Kirsten, you ask your question, and then we can go over to Sokoko for. 15 minutes before uh, the next talk. You're super kind and uh, thanks, thanks for your patience. So um, uh, we had this way of uh, getting chow from K naught and we right. have this relationship between um, uh, K and all the motivic cohomologies, but we have this cycle class map, um, which sends something in chow to something in lots of cohomology theories, like in particular motivic cohomology. So do we get anything cool if we, if we do both? So we first, we take K naught and we go into Chow and we do cycle class map to motivic, get someplace else in K theory. I mean, at, worst you, get multipl at worst you get multiplication by J minus one factorial up to a dimension co-dimension issue. <laughs> but don't, aren't you in a different K group when you? Mm, no, hopefully not. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's thank Matthew for uh, his <laughs> great talking conversation.